Hi, I'm William, reporting for the Fun Robotics Network. I am here with Team 14380, the Blue Bot Builders. They were the Winning Alliance Captain and Inspire Award at the North Brisbane Regional. Learn about their innovative dual active intakes, their sorting, their free sort mechanism, as well as their gameplay strategy, all on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. So, entering the start of the season, what was your strategy for the game? Yeah, so we performed some game analysis at the start of the season and we found this game was very similar to FRC in the way defense is handled. We found that lots of teams would be playing defense and making it harder to intake artifacts throughout the match. And that's what mainly led us to the dual intake design, uh, being able to move rapidly and get away from defense by moving to forwards and backwards and always using the full power of our Mechanum drive train. So could you showcase those two your intakes and how they work as well as so, so that the audience uh, can kind of see it? So you can... So as you can see, the artifacts automatically shuffle themselves around inside of our storage system. They can do this passively dependent on how fast they come into our robot and that's consistent pretty much every time. So I see that, that you have a, a bear motor driving your, your intake. Could you explain how that's run? So we're using the Axon bevel gears from our bear motor and that goes into a pulley system and then onto our intake roller, which has a lot of compliance. Um, we found this to be a really successful intake design because it means that we can pretty much always um, be able to touch the uh, touch the artifacts and then be able to own them and intake them into the robot. Uh, the bear motor uh, we found is really useful because of the high RPM that it enables us to do and also its lower weight. So, so yeah, I see that you also have the, the ramp leading into it and that bungee, what, what does uh, that do? Yeah, so the bungee cord enables the artifacts to stay within the robot after they've been intaked. So as you saw in our demonstration earlier, the compliant intake has enough power to push them inside the robot. However, when they're jiggling around, they're quite stable inside. They won't really fall out. So I see that multiple type of designs have had spindexes. This one doesn't. Could you explain the uniqueness of that? So what makes our design unique from the typical Spindexer is the fact that our thing doesn't actually rotate. So what happens is each of each slot in our sorting mechanism has these little flicker foot, flicker feet. So what happens is Ryan will demonstrate, um, showcase, showcase, pardon? Okay, so the ball, so the ball, the artifact comes in through the intake as per normal and lands in one of the zones, then what happens is the flywheel can spin up and the little flicker can flick all the artifacts out up into this flywheel and shoot out. Yeah. So, yeah, so the kickers enabled you to sort. What was kind of the constraints that you had with those kickers? Well, the kickers were largely uh, dependent upon the design of the actual shuffler walls inside the robot. Uh, so the walls kind of had to be designed around how they would be mounted, such as the servo mounts, and we kind of wanted uh, different designs for each wall due to how the uh, artifacts are stored within the transfer of the robot. And the, the 
Flicker feet themselves actually went through a lot of different iterations based on the actual centerpiece of the uh, artifact transfer mount. So it used to, uh, I remember when the flickers were a lot like uh, shorter and they would actually not hold the artifact as well. So we had to go through a lot of iterations like that. I also see that you have uh, some light or color sensors. Can you explain that? So in each recessed landing zone in our shuffler, there is two color sensors that are used to detect the color of each artifact in, in the shuffler. So the cool thing about having two is that we've mounted them in such a way so that because the artifact has holes in it, one of them will always be seeing the actual body of the artifact. So we have an accurate an accurate knowledge of which color each artifact is in the zone. So moving on from the type of sorting system, going to your like turret and your launcher, how does that kind of work and how is that mounted? Uh, all right, so how we actually mount the turret to start with is um, we have it on a, uh, it's a WCP bearing. So it's a lot thinner than your um, lazy Susan bearing. So that allows us to save space and actually a decent amount of weight. And in order to mount that, we have it uh, recessed into the whole of our carbon fiber plates. Uh, the hooded turret sits on this 3D print, which slides into that bearing. And uh, that 3D print can be pushed down onto the bearing. But in order to keep it from coming off, we've had to use these additional little bearings that ride along the surface of that 3D print in order to get that pressure downwards to hold it in place. After that, we have a chain driven sprocket in order to add, turn its bearing, which has been driven by a uh, DC motor here. Afterwards, on top of the turret, we have a 72 millimeter Go Build a Rhino wheel for our flywheel, which was useful over a large one, as although it's a bit slower um, with a ball velocity, uh, we were able to avoid hitting the height limit because our robot has to be so high for the sorting system Bigger flywheels would mean we'd have to limit our firing angle. Um, so we had to use the smallest flywheel we could get. For the hood, we have a carbon fiber plate and we use two rails along it, which allows us to actually have the ball self-center inside of it rather than a flat surface. So if the ball is only touching one whale, the, the way the force will go, it has to push itself back towards the center. So horizontally, we're quite accurate. And in order to change the angle of that, we have two pinion gears that ride along the racks and that's driven by a servo here. And we've actually used a timing belt to spin that because there's actually a decent amount of impact that happens on the hood. And in order to reduce the force of that impact on the servo shaft, we made it have a little bit of give. And also we've only used one bear motor and a timing belt in order to spin it. Because although two would work, We've actually had a lot of success with one and we're able to reduce our weight and the power draw. So how do you make sure that you maintain that momentum for each of the rapid fire shots? Yeah, so even though it looks like there's just the two rhino wheels, we actually have a metal gear that we've smoothed out and is actually inside of those two rhino wheels that helps us build the mass of the flywheel and keep momentum. So what's some of those, uh, obviously that there's this cool uh, mechanical side, but what are some of the software components that you've developed? One of my favorite software components on this robot is our indicator light. Uh, this is really, really useful for our drivers in a match. Um, if we can set that up. Uh, because it will tell our drivers when our robot is ready to launch the artifacts, uh, which makes it really, really helpful as a driver assist, um, particularly when lining up and about to score the artifacts. Some other software things we have on this robot is the limelight, which we're able to read the April tag detections in order to one, align our turret towards that tag so it always shooting towards the center and secondly get the, our distance to that tag. We're currently using an interpolation lookup table that can interpolate the values in between each distance that can change both the flywheel speed and also the hood angle.
Uh, additionally, we have a secondary lookup table that takes uh, error from the flywheel speed to what our desired speed is. That can also uh, counter for that loss in momentum every time we launch the artifact. So what happens when your limelight is covered, especially during those uh, defense plays? Yep, with that, when the limelight becomes covered, we're able to switch to our odometry system. Now this year, we're continuing to stick with the Go Builder pinpoint with the two four bar odometry pots. And we found that to be really consistent again. So now going into nationals, what are some of the upgrades that you wanna make for it? One of the uh, best upgrades we can do if we have the ability to do it with our motor count would be to have a second uh, bare motor for our launcher. Uh, while we have found that we're able to successfully uh, fire and launch all three artifacts within about a second uh, with our single bare motor, particularly on the recovery time, we reckon we can uh, launch them much faster if we do have a second bare motor. Another upgrade that we look, that we consider making for nationals is relating to the base park. So a key aspect of the game is being able to get two robots in the base zone at once because that gets lots of points. So before regionals, one of our members actually designed this mechanism, which uses an over-centering linkage to turn to turn um a uh, pivot up, and we'll have we have two of those in our robot, and it will cause the robot to pivot up on its side, so that it can we take up a lot less space in the base park zone and it over-centers so we stay up at the end of the match when our power is cut. So yeah, James will demonstrate that. Yeah. So yeah, how would you go from uh, the fact is you have a motor running your inter your turret, or how would you, what motor would you save for your second motor for your launcher? Yeah, so we'd remove this turret motor and replace them instead with two servos. Since we're only using four servos out of the eight allotted, uh, we can spare those extra two to drive our turret instead. And using some math like the Chinese remainder theorem, we are able to know that position of that turret and implement the same software that we have currently with the motor. Thank you so much for just describing uh, the robot. Congratulations uh, again. And this has been Team 14380 Blue Bob Builders. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Animark is your one stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high quality and affordable solutions. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands on co op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first.